Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. A summer holiday week, Americans are on the road and in the skies. Kayak CEO Steve Hafner says, ready for takeoff. The airlines added a lot of capacity going into the summer flying season, and demand hasn't quite kept up with that. And after 248 years of American dreaming, have today's generations finally woken up? CNBC's John Fort. An essential part of the American dream on July 4th is sometimes seemingly irrational optimism that despite overwhelming odds, this generation can make things more fair and more economically just for the next one. All that today, plus a big win for Eli Lilly's Alzheimer's treatment, another episode in the play for Paramount, and shifting tides in the Democratic Party. CNBC's Megan Casella in D.C. Among some Democratic donors and fundraisers who had been sticking with the president through the weekend are now telling me that they don't think that this can last. There's an emerging consensus among this group that President Biden will have to step aside. It is Wednesday, July 3rd, 2024. Frickin' July 4th. Can we please be happy to be here? Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand under by in three, two, one, Q Andrew. Good morning. Welcome back to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We're live at the NASDAQ Market Set in Times Square. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin, along with Joe Kern. Becky is off today as we all get uh, ready for July 4th. Uh, are you here Friday? I am here Friday. Oh, good. So so my, okay, so that'll be the, uh, the employment number. Nobody needs to know what I witnessed, uh, obviously. But um, I broke my pinky toe, folks, and Joe had to watch the indignity that I had outside coming from, coming from 7th Avenue hobbling I don't, across the, the, the street, looking at me like I was. I don't want to laugh at, at something like that, but I, I mean, you're laughing because. Well, because I, it, yes, I'm on Advil, but that's about as far as it's gotten so far. And, and some ice. And you, some look ice. Like, you look like you were on um, like ethyl alcohol or, or, or vodka. Come, I mean, that was um, watching that, but uh, let's, well, nobody needs to know all the, de- oh, you already told them. Though. I'm not. It's, I'm not it's laughing. The pinky toe. I'm, it's, the it's the pinky, pinky toe. Ha, you know, the big toe is in the way of everything. That's usually what you would break. How do you break a? a not that we need to know all these things. I'm not going to get into the details because okay. it's even right. more embarrassing than, it, the, is it, than uh, the way it looked. I mean, is it a kind of a cool story? No, you know it's what not I'm a saying? cool story. Is it's it, it's uh, about no? the least cool story you could ever have. So it's not something I'd like to. No. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do know what you're saying. You work on some weird stuff. Or, no. <laughs> all right. All right. Paramount Global moving higher this morning, and it looks like uh, this could be it finally. Sources uh, telling CNBC that David Ellison's Skydance Media has now reached a preliminary deal to buy Sherry Redstone's National Amusements and then merge it with Paramount Global. Uh, The resurrected deal, which initially fell apart just a few weeks ago, uh, would see Redstone receive a reduced one and three quarter billion dollars for National Amusements and have Skydance acquire rough, roughly half of Paramount's controlling shares for $4.5 billion. Paramount's special committee is currently reviewing and voting uh, on the new deal. Remember, it was just yesterday, uh, media reports had uh, uh, Barry Diller showing interest in the company. Private equity firm Apollo and Sony had also shown interest in, I don't know what to say. I thought, you know, I thought he was gone. I thought they were gone. And they, it was weird. Oh, I always Barry, thought they could come back. The question yeah. was what they would come back at. And Barry coming be back? Anybody else? Is, is it over now? It's, it's, I think you thing. still have a couple other players maybe around yeah. uh, NIA. But if Sherry Redstone wants to look, as we said, Sherry Redstone's going to make the decision at the end of the day. Right. Full stop. This is, it could this be is, in the morning, could be at the beginning of the day. She could do it. She could right. Do it at the beginning it, of the you day don't too. know. Shares of Eli Lilly moving higher this morning. The Food and Drug Administration approving Eli Lilly's Alzheimer's drug, uh, denunumab, uh, expanding the limited treatment options for the disease in the U.S. The drug will be sold under the brand name uh, Kisuna Kisuna Kisuna. for for adults with early symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. Now, according to the company. I mean, it doesn't seem right that you come in here to say basically disabled and they give you those two right out of the box they give right you those the box they give you this with a broken with, with a broken, a broken toe. toe with a broken toe, pinky toe. Oh, he says he's apologizing now that that he did that but they didn't need to do that did they no no one need, 
and Denanimab. Denanimab. It's not really your fault. It's not really our fault. It's the company's fault for coming up with that. Tough one. Yeah, it's for coming one. up with that. Former President Trump's sentencing date in the Stormy Daniels uh, hush money case has been p postponed now by more than two months. The judge in the case making the decision uh, after Trump's attorneys uh, requested uh, that he do this. Uh, that are challenging the conviction based on the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court decision earlier this week. Sentencing will now take place on September 18th. That's still uh, well before the November 5th presidential election. He, he could still, be, if the judge really wants to throw the book, he could still theoretically be behind bars leading up to the... It's very unlikely. Because I think, I'm not sure how that would, put, I'm sure that help, how does it help or hurt? but you couldn't campaign for the last uh, two months. Cracks in Democratic support for President Biden are starting to show, trickling in yesterday. Uh, it, it all goes back, probably in the end, to donors. Some donors to camp his campaign may be starting to change their tune. Uh, Megan Casella joins us now. I'm, I think uh, uh, the 25, we don't know yet. It started with the guy from Austin, Texas, I think, then a guy in Maine, uh, both in the House, Right, uh, Megan, and then uh, former President Obama kind of pulled back his, uh, you know, his sort of solid, which really wasn't that solid in the first place. But he's kind of pulled back. Megan, the, the, the betting sites now predict it on who will be the Democratic nominee, basically tied. I think maybe it's been President might be one one cent ahead at 41 to 40, and same with the against Trump. They're uh, they're both tied. That's. That's a 20 cent difference than where it was before. Things are moving very quickly. They're moving very quickly, Joe. And it's been a very rough 24 hours or so for the president after a very rough five or so days since that debate. And one of the notable shifts I want to highlight here is among some Democratic donors and fundraisers who had been sticking with the president through the weekend are now telling me that they don't think that this can last. There's an emerging consensus among this group that President Biden will have to step aside. They think that, you know, he's really weakening the down party candidates, that there's no way that he can survive. It's gotten much more negative, the tone has, over the past 24 hours for all of the reasons that you mentioned plus the leaked polling that came out yesterday that showed since the debate, Biden had lost about two percentage points in pretty much every battleground state. And like you said, in the predicted markets, people are really starting to think now about the possibility of a President Harris. Joe. Or, or, or yeah, a, a candidate for president. In, uh, and, and, and candidate the, Harris. Yeah, sure. and, the po and the possibility. You got a George Stephanopoulos gets the interview. Yep. It's not even live. Uh, you know, so God knows. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, after everything that's happened and all the, the criticism of the media, I, I don't think they'd edit it in, in a, and I'm not sure what they want. They probably want, you know, like a lot of mainstream media, I think, want Biden out now because you heard James Carville. That was the one that got me initially where he said, uh, things that can't continue won't. And you just wonder whether, but don't underestimate that inner sanctum of, uh, you know, the, the first lady. Uh, and the president's son and Ted Kaufman and, and others long time they he can stay if he wants can't he Megan that you can't tell him he has to leave no one can tell him that that's right. There's very little that anyone could do on their own to get him to step aside. It has to be a decision that, that Biden himself makes. And like you said, that inner sanctum is really difficult to get into. But one of the big shifts yesterday that we did see that some of the donors I've been talking to flagged as something that changed their minds were those comments from Nancy Pelosi and Jim Clyburn, two of President Biden's close yep. allies in Congress. My recommendation to, uh, is, uh, is for him to have some interviews with serious journalists, you among them, a serious journalist, no holds barred, any questions fair, and just sit there and be Joe. I want this ticket to continue to be Biden-Harris, and then uh, we'll see what happens uh, after the next election. No, this party should not in any way do anything to work around uh, Ms. Harris. 
they were still in support of him, but they were a little bit measured, saying, yes, you know, they were sort of validating concerns about his health. One person I spoke with said the one thing that seems like it might be able to change President Biden's mind and the one thing to watch for is whether those two and other congressional leaders, not just the rank and file, like you mentioned, if the leaders start to come out publicly, that's when maybe the campaign will have to start to recognize, or at least the president will have to start to recognize something. But like you said, it's not an easy pitch to make. The donors are hoping to have influence. Uh, they can do as much as they can by threatening to with, withhold money and that sort of thing, but there's nothing anyone can do on their own. Well, the real possibility of, of him not being the candidate is, is front and center now, but the heir apparent is absolutely Vice President Harris at this point. Uh, the, the gentleman in Michigan saying, you know, we'd take a very dim view uh, of passing over the vice president. That's pretty weird that Kamala right. Harris is above. And then there's also one for who will be the Democratic um, presidential nominee. And I think it's now 41 uh, President Biden and 39 uh, Kamala Harris. But, but if you were wondering who's it going to be, whether Gavin Newsom or anybody else had a chance, uh, it looks almost like. And, and some Democrats, are, I think, are starting to figure out how they'd go about uh, running. Kamala Harris, addressing certain concerns, definitely highlighting her strengths that she's been out, on, you know, in the last couple of weeks on abortion and things like that, uh, to try to maybe overcome. And nobody so knows. So, who how is the ideal VP for her? I saw Andy Bashir. I saw a, 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 a but um, Josh Shapiro. People are talking about. Who, do but you, you think that all the players who were not on the list as as a potential president are not on the vice VP list? So where's Gavin Newsom lie on this list? You don't want necessarily two people from California. I don't I know. I don't think he. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know and what don't he know would do. It. Want it. Whitmer. Right, that, all of a sudden, you say Whitmer, who was sort of high on a, the list. He was a prior sort of a top. Yeah, I don't know. Does that does that change? Fascinating though. It's fascinating. You know, I have my. And own I think cinema. one point to make yeah. too on Harris. One point to make on Harris, too, is that she's polling fairly well. The betting markets have her up. And that's before she's chosen a VP, as Andrew said. So if you think yeah. about somebody who is already broadly popular, who might be leading right. a state already, maybe a southern right. state like Bashir, Roy Cooper in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, yeah. those are, that's something that could boost her further. So you're absolutely yeah. right. The party's starting yeah. to think about her much more seriously it's now. So 70% of the country doesn't know who Bashir is. I think it's, I think it's sort of touching Bill Ackman now. It says, wow, CNN, they've really done a good job since the debate. Yeah, they want Biden out. I, I mean, yeah, they've done a good job now being honest, uh, finally. They want Biden out because they're worried. It's so, no, yes, no, no. yes, yes. And I'm not gonna accuse you of that because you were, you were sort of down on, you, you, you recognize- Down the middle is what I was down well, yeah, on. No, oh, yeah, down the me middle. too. Uh, but the, 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 the infirmity part of the whole thing, you, you acknowledged. Yes. Before many. Cheese will be next. Still to come, busy airports and highways over the July 4th holiday, our Phil LeBeau reports. And we are on the cusp of seeing our first day with three million passengers being screened by the TSA here in the U.S. And booking site Kayak CEO says it's a good time to take to the air. You're getting great fares. The average airfare is down two to four percent domestically year over year. But if you pick your route right, you can be down 18%. Squawk Pod will be right back. This is Squawk Pod. Stand by, Joe. His mic here. You're watching Squawk Box uh, on CNBC. I'm Joe Kernan, along with Andrew Ross Sorkin. News just in from uh, Southwest Airlines this morning. The carrier has adopted a so-called poison pill. This after activist investor Al Elliott Management disclosing an 11% stake. Now, Elliott has been pushing for changes at Southwest and criticized the airline's management team after the company's latest cut in revenue guidance, the shareholder rights plan, making it more difficult for Elliott uh, to increase its stake without negotiating directly with Southwest. Fourth of July travel rush uh, is expected to be the busiest in history. You're not at O'Hare, are you? Lebeau, Phil Lebeau joins us now. Uh, I'm not. More. No, I'm I would not, drive Joe, I some. I would, people flying, why, why bother? Driving the great open highway, it's nice, Stuckey's is around. Depends I mean, on would, where you're going. I would drive. Uh, let me show you what we're expecting in the skies, because it will be and has been a very busy week. Busiest week ever? Well, if you look at the numbers, it backs it up. 
There, in fact, last Thursday, go back to last Thursday. It's really when people start measuring Fourth of July travel about a week beforehand and the three or four days afterwards. A record number of flights, almost 54,000 in one day. And we are on the cusp of seeing our first day with 3 million passengers being screened by the TSA here in the U.S. For some perspective on ter in terms of travel now and how many people are flying versus last year and previous years, take a look at the number of people screened by the TSA. In June, the daily average was 2.73 million passengers per day, well above what we saw last year, which was a record year. And most people believe, again, that we will see a 3 million passenger day maybe today, maybe on Sunday, which is when a lot of people come back from the 4th of July. Domestic capacity is part of what we're seeing driving the number of people who are flying right now. If you're looking to go somewhere, generally speaking, You've got more options than ever before. And in certain markets, there's too much capacity. Let's say Las Vegas. That's a good example. A number of destinations in Florida. The industry has added so many street seats to some of these destinations that many believe that when you get past Labor Day, we're going to see a pullback because there's overcapacity in the system. Take a look at shares of the major airline stocks, including Southwest. And I know you guys just had the news about the adoption of the poison pill. Remember that airfares are down about 2%. Some of that is because of this overcapacity in the system domestically. But right now is, relatively speaking, a great time to fly if you're looking for a domestic airfare because you are seeing them close to, not record lows, but really darn close to the lowest levels we've seen in a long time, guys. You know, Phil, uh, the, the post-pandemic, uh, what we saw, the big rush to do all these things, I think it, 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 it may have moderated, but we, we're at a permanently higher level, I think. I think we are. We talked to Ed Bastian about this last week. They see no sign of slowing bookings. We're not adding necessarily new planes. We're filling them up even even higher. So we're flying loads consistently in the 90% range, maybe 95% range on certain days. So it's not as, as if we can get more seats in the sky, but we're putting more people in them. It is in the system right now. Now, corporate travel is not yet back to pre-pandemic right. levels. It's still a little bit below there. But in terms of leisure travel, we're there. And we're there for, I think, I hate to say for good, because for something may change if you get a recession, et cetera. But we're there on a permanent basis in terms of crowded airplanes, crowded airports, a lot of people flying, uh, doing leisure trips. Right. What else are you going to spend your money on once you got a couple of big screen TVs? So we're gonna, you got every streaming service. You, you got your bundle. I got an you, idea. Go out to Yankee Stadium. See your Reds play the Yankees. That's, uh, did you see last night? See Ellie? I did. I, I, who doesn't like watching Ellie? You know what? I think it's just beginning. It's just beginning, but if, we were just talking about it, in fact. Who's here? Uh, he's only hitting 250, but 250 is like 330. It's like the, 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 today hitting 250 yeah. is like hitting 330 because everybody's swinging for the fences. Is that right? why? But right. if he hits, if he, he line, stretches. You have to, when, he yep. is, when he is on the field, you have to watch him. Most exciting player in baseball right now. One of the most because exciting Because if he hits a single, it usually right turns into a triple because of those strides. Right. It's, it is, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. He was so proud yesterday, too, in front of you know, all, the, all the DR people, the Dominican Republic people in the, in the stands. He was so proud. It's awesome. It's a great story, Phil. Thank you for bringing it that is. up. Fantastic story. You were a Cubbies guy, right? Or a White Sox. <laughs> You Cubbies or White Sox? Tend to be more you of a White Sox say. person, but we don't like to talk about that right now. It's a rough <laughs> time on the south side of Chicago. It is. Yeah, yeah that speaks volumes. When is it not? All right, thank you. Meantime, uh, let's uh, bring in Kayak CEO Steve Hafner, uh, get a sense of what's going on uh, in the skies and travel. Uh, Steve, it's great to see you. As you know, I am a uh, regular and uh, almost religious kayak user. I, more for the interface than anything else. I think maybe it's... Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't know if it's just um, you know been doing it for so long. So, Steve, what are you what are you actually seeing? And I know you're you're more on the consumer end of things than on the business side of things. But in terms of where you're seeing prices and what kind of appetite there is for for this sort of YOLO economy to continue. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, for having me back. And I, I love and appreciate you using kayak. You know, Phil got it right. It's it's a very busy travel season, which is a great time to be in the travel business. You know, we are going to see 3 million people a day passing through airports. I'm highly confident of that. 
And then the roads are going to be crowded. So if you talk to AAA, there's going to be over 60 million people on the roads this weekend, which is an amazing thing because July 4th is on Wednesday. So all that travel volume is smeared out, if you will, across two weekends. And for, for those of you who are traveling by air, you're getting great fares. So, you know, I think the average airfare is down 2 to 4% domestically year over year. But if you pick your route right, you can be down 18% according to Kayak's data. Um, so if you're if you're going down south to like Florida, great deals to be had. I don't know why you want to go there because it's pretty hot, but great deals to be had there. What do you think is happening in the, the hotel and lodging universe? So for the moment, prices are still high because demand's still high. So according to Kayak data, uh, flight query, sorry, hotel and car queries are up 6% year over year. And, and prices on the hotel level, about 280 a day, so up 4%. And if you're running a car, it's about $100 a day, up 6%. But I suspect as we head into the fall, those prices will come down. That's typically what happens. So if you can afford to, to wait, do so. All right. The 2 to 4% decrease in prices on air, is that uh, economy or is that across the board? I think it's capacity. Okay. You know, so the airlines added a lot of capacity going into the summer flying season and demand hasn't quite kept up with that. And I also think their input costs, so fuel and labor, are a little bit lower than they anticipated. So they're able to, to lower prices a bit. But, you know, if your your average aircraft domestically is still three hundred and fifty dollars, which is robust, unless, of course, you're flying Spirit or someone else. And if you're trying to get outside of the U.S. to Europe, for example, that's eleven hundred dollars for a for a coach class seat, which is which is still a high ticket price. OK, final question, just because you know, I'm a cheapskate and I want to get a, get some value. Do you do you actually think the combined deals are better or do you actually think separating things are better? I've always found the separating things turns out to be better in the end, but I know that's not the business model. Yeah, no, if you bundle uh, flights and hotels, you typically will say, but you lose flexibility, right? So I, I, I tend to and most Americans are like this. They don't buy bundles. Europeans are different. They do. Uh, but I think if you actually really want to save um, it, Andy, I, I, I know you like using the kayak app. Take a picture of a travel itinerary, uh, send it to us via the Kayak app, and we'll tell you if you got a great deal or not. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, cool. Steve, thank you. Happy Independence Day. You too, Andrew. Take care. Next on Squawk Pod, in honor of this holiday week, our John Fort takes a look at two sides of one question. Is the American dream dead? What you think may depend on when you were born. I'm certainly not going to judge whether the American dream is alive or not by what millennials are doing. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Squawk Pod, today with Joe Kernan and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Here's Joe. The American dream turns 248 years old uh, tomorrow, counting from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. About the high cost of living and the growing inequality in the economy, it's fair to ask, is the American dream uh, dying? People say it's already dead. It, uh, I, don't like, I don't like this one. I hope you come down on that it's still. Well, you can count on me, Joe. <laughs> to, 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 <laughs> to move that pen from right to left and, 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 and for me not to know what you really think. Yes. All right. I'm listening closely. I hope you make a really good case for one, but it's sort of a wimpy case for the other. Well, Joe. You don't do it that way. The American dream is dying, and it's important <laughs> to admit that so we can save it. First, a definition. It was first clearly articulated in 1931 by historian James Truslow Adams in his book, The Epic of America. He said, not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable. It echoes the Declaration's equality, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So what's gone wrong? Well, in the last couple of decades, this chasm has widened between the rich and everyone else, and it's destroying social mobility, the idea that kids can do better than their parents did. 90% of kids born in 1940 grew up to earn more than their parents. Only half of millennials born in 1985 are doing that. And it sure looks like things are getting worse. Fresh data today shows many millennials in Gen Y can't afford to buy homes. Education, student loan debt per student doubled to top 37,650 bucks over the last 15 years. Now this post-pandemic inflation surge is the straw that broke the camel's back. How can people be thrilled about earning a few extra bucks an hour when rent nearly swallows it all, home ownership is out of reach, and college loans don't pencil out? Save the dream, 
fix the system so talent wins, Joe? The second one that you do is normally the one you believe in. So what, what's, the, <laughs> what's, the, what's the benchmark uh, year for the American dream? What are we trying, where are we trying to get back? Well, Joe, on the other hand, the American dream isn't dying. Loving America means knowing the truth. The dream's never been fully alive for everyone, and the work of our republic is to make it more real each generation. In 1776, America didn't yet exist as a sovereign nation, much less as a dreamer. July 4th was as much a baby shower as a birthday. And the Supreme Court's wrong-headed 1857 decision in the Dred Scott case nearly killed the potential for an American dream. It took a war to bring it back. When Trussell Adams animated the idea in 1931, the Great Depression raged and unemployment was on a march to over 20%. So it's no shock that kids born a decade later would earn more than their parents. But Here's why the American dream isn't dying. The American people have more access to more knowledge than ever in history. We have better financial products and investing tools, and as expensive as traditional four-year colleges are, between community colleges and online education, getting skills for career advancement doesn't have to break the bank. So bottom line, an essential part of the American dream and July 4th is sometimes seemingly irrational optimism that despite overwhelming odds, this generation can make things more fair and more economically just for the next one. Things are better than you think, Joe. No, they're not. They are, they are good. And, and I'm certainly not going to judge whether the American dream is alive or not by what millennials are doing. All right. So that, that's, a, that's a number. I mean, no, I'm kidding. I'm, ki I'm kind of kidding. But it's a work in progress. We know it's a work in progress. I would say you're a damn good example. I was in an orphanage when I was born, so I oh, mean, for sure. not, not that I'm the, the end all be all. Now, well, you were in Scarsdale or something. Maybe, maybe, no, I'm kidding. We all have overcome things to get here, and, and, degree, and we've got a modicum of success, I think, which is. A modicum, yes. <laughs> a modicum of success. The one thing I was thinking when you were saying that, is there another country where they say, are you going to achieve the French dream? Are you going to achieve the Cuban dream? Are you going to achieve? Just by the, because we call it something so unique and American exceptionalism has stood the test of time where we talk about, we argue about whether the American dream is, you don't even talk about that anywhere else. And, and people, do they not want to come here still to try to get a piece of this? Challenge? Absolutely, absolutely. So you, the, the second part we believed in more. Well. <laughs> I'll tell you head. what. <laughs> Read the newsletter, and yeah. you can decide which one you believe more. Type in cnbc.com slash OTOH. You get the full text. We've been arguing about arguments. this for years. And we've, yeah. That's what you've been arguing about for we years have since the American years. dream? Oh. We've, been, we've been arguing about what the, de what the definition of the dream is. Is yeah. it the Horatio Alger story? Is it uh, some other I think kind no. of story? I think no. Uh, After doing the research on this one. You know, it's, yeah. it's, is it just upward mobility? Look. You could look at the, I was actually thinking about this, the valuation of the European stock market in 2007 was based, of all of Europe, was basically the same as the US. Today, our, the valuation of our markets, I think, are four or five times right. the entire, by the way, the size of NVIDIA is larger than the That's entire I mean. valuation of all of, uh, of every stock you, in you, France. You, you know what that would say? That would, that would say that trying to game outcomes instead of opportunities and, and the, the, you know, the endless quest for total egalitarian societies ends up lowering everybody down here. You'd rather have some people up here if everyone's trying to get there. I'd rather try to join people at the top than join them at the bottom. You're not going to get any disagreement on that front. The question is how you, how you affect your frickin' that. July 4th. Can we please be happy to be here and, and believe in We're the We're definitely dream? happy to be here. <laughs> We're happy to be here. Okay. Yeah. And we disagree, which is also right. American. Not yeah. on this issue, though. <laughs> not on this issue. Right. You're okay. going to be less happy to be here on Friday. That's the, that's the <laughs> You difference. know what? Just think about it like we that. We should never, ever complain never. about mm. That's true. Right? Absolutely. We shouldn't. <laughs> right, yeah. right. That, look, it's a work in progress. Let's get everyone to the point where, you know, if, if they if work hard and, and do the best they can, get to that position where they have a chance. Yes. And, and then it's up to them. And that's the pod for today. 
Thanks for listening. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern. Follow Squawk Pod wherever you get your podcasts to get the best of our show anytime. We will be off tomorrow for the July 4th holiday, but right back in your feed on Friday. Have a great holiday. Happy Independence Day.